You know, for me, if I like how 60 Hertz sounds on the kick and I also like how it sounds on the bass, I'll just boost both, I don't care. If you've mainly learned mixing from YouTube, then what I'm about to tell you is probably the exact opposite of everything you've heard. But these are the things that took me from always struggling with the low end and having it never translate outside of my studio to finally getting a big and powerful low end that sounds good on all speakers. So let's start with the most controversial low end tip first, and that's to let the frequencies overlap. So there's tons of tutorials out there from who I like to call YouTube mixers who talk about carving out different frequency spaces for the instruments. For example, let's say they want the punch of their kick to be at 60 Hertz. So then they'll go to their bass track and they'll you know, high pass filter that at like 70 or higher so that those two low frequencies don't really overlap at all between the bass and the kick. Or they'll do the opposite. They'll let the bass go lower down in the frequency range and then they'll stop the kick from, from living down there. But here's the problem with that. Most of the time when people are doing this, they're committing the cardinal sin of mixing, which is that they're following an idea instead of their ears. It's all just based on the thoughts that are in their head. You know, okay, I'm boosting 60 Hertz on kick. Therefore I have to go and cut it on bass. And once you start mixing like this, you have lost the game. Let's go like way back to the basics here. It is called mixing for a reason. You do want things to interact. And the funny thing is, is the same people who talk about isolating and how they carve out different frequency ranges for their instruments. Well, they turn around and they complain about how their mixes don't sound glued together. And I definitely get it. I went through this phase myself when I was at an intermediate level. I started to overthink and overdo everything. And I was trying to mix like more like a math equation using more of my mind and my eyes than my ears. But eventually I did get over that and I was able to stop mixing with my eyes and start just using my ears and going with my instinct based on what I heard. And when I started doing that, this whole concept and habit of carving things out to different frequency ranges just completely fell apart. And I'll show you an example here of what this sounds like in action. So if we've got uh, the drums and bass soloed here, So I pull up the bass EQ here and we're boosting at 66, couple dB. We've also got this uh, low control plugin which is compressing everything below 90 and then boosting it all. So think of it as like a low shelf from 90 down. So everything from 90 below being boosted by another 6 dB here on this plugin. Now if we pull up the kick drum, lo and behold, I'm boosting everything below 80. So I'm boosting essentially the same frequencies on both the kick and bass. Now, what if I had mixed this with that carving idea in mind and thought, well, I don't, I don't want to boost these at the same area. Well, let's go ahead and create an alternate EQ for my kick drum here. So remember, I was boosting uh, the bass guitar, especially around 66. So let's filter this around 80 to try and make sure that we don't have any kick or as much kick down there. And then instead of boosting at 60, let's boost more around 80 or 85. Better throw on my headphones so I can actually hear the low end. So it's not like this sounds bad, but let me flip back and forth between the original EQ I had and this one. And this is a subtle difference, but focus on that low end, use headphones if you have to, see if you can pick out what I'm gonna say here. So while the carved out version sounds more separate, this version where I'm boosting the same frequencies on both, it sounds glued. Like the low end, the kick and the bass, they sound like they're moving together. And it actually makes the bass guitar sound bigger because we have this extra low end in the kick. And it's the same thing on so many of my mixes. Like look at this from one of the Silverstein records. This is the kick drum on the SSL channel here, right around 60 Hertz we're boosting. And then on the bass guitar on this multiband compressor, look. Down below 60, we're boosting the same thing on the bass. Here's a Nick Johnson record, kick on the left, bass on the right. This is a little higher. It's more around 70, 75, but we're boosting the same range on both the kick and the bass. This is for the most recent Emery record. Check this out. Right around 60, huge boost on the kick drum. Right around 60, 65, big boost on the bass. And I think the low end is fine on all of those records, but 
you're free to judge that for yourself. You know, for me, if I like how 60 Hertz sounds on the kick and I also like how it sounds on the bass, I'll just boost both, I don't care. And if it starts to sound like it's too much or it's getting too, too crazy, then I'll just listen for that, I'll hear it, and then I'll adjust it accordingly. The bottom line is you have to stop imagining your mix as this puzzle of frequencies in your mind that you have to like remove and carve out and slot things in like that. It, it really doesn't work like that. What you actually need to do is far simpler. Don't be afraid of frequencies. Don't be afraid of overlap. Remember, it's called mixing. And ultimately, just listen. Don't be guided by random thoughts and ideas. Just be guided by your ears. All right, the next controversial tip for better low end. This is going to sound kind of backwards. Don't mix with a subwoofer. I mean, trust me, it is going to fool you. Anything below 100 hertz, you wanna spend the least amount of time possible focusing on that when you're mixing. This is another mistake that I was guilty of too. It's kind of related to the whole carving out thing I just talked about, but I would obsess and spend forever on those frequencies, on trying to get that, that 50 hertz to 100 hertz range really nailed in my mix. I would tweak and massage it in my studio until I could stand in the back of the room and get it to really like, punch my chest in the way that I wanted. But then unfortunately, my mix sucked everywhere else. The low end was never powerful outside of my studio. And it wasn't until I got NS10s where I couldn't hear those sub frequencies that all of a sudden my low end started sounding big. It's kind of weird. The less time I spent on those frequencies, better they came out. It's got to the point where these days I spend a max of three, maybe five minutes just throwing on headphones so I can hear those low frequencies. I'll reference it against another mix or master that I like. And I'll just check, do I have too much of that low-end sub rumble? Is there not enough? And I'll just adjust accordingly. And often it just looks like this. You know, let's say I'm referencing against another record and I think, oh, my kick doesn't punch enough. Well, I'll just bring up my uh, low-end kick EQ. And I'll just boost more of it until I get that low-end punch in the same ballpark. And I'm really paying no attention to kind of what those specific frequencies are and whether there's an overlap between the bass and kick, I just listen and I just do it. Part of the reason for this is those low end sub frequencies, they are the most unpredictable when you take the mix outside of the studio, depending on what car they're in or, or headphones or ear pods or environment they're listening in, those low frequencies are either gonna translate or they're gonna sound thin because they're canceled out on the environment or they're gonna be hyped up because the person's got a big subwoofer in their car. You never know what that's gonna sound like outside of the studio. And so those really low sub frequencies, those are not where the low end power comes from in your mix. So where does the low end power really come from? Well, that leads me perfectly into the third controversial low end tip. Don't cut the low mids. If you want your low end to sound big and fat and powerful, even on small speakers, then you need to have enough low mid content in there. And I'm talking about the 100 to 400 hertz area. The problem with these frequencies and, and why people struggle to get this right is because those are also the muddy frequencies. And most people on YouTube, they will tell you that the first thing you need to do in your mix is go searching for all the bad frequencies and the muddy frequencies and cut them out. Now guess what? If you go searching for muddy frequencies, you're gonna find them every time and you're gonna boost them, it's gonna sound bad, and you're gonna cut them out. And when I was a beginner, I did this all the time. Like I, I mixed in solo, which was the first problem, but check this out. Let's just go rhythm guitars here. Now in solo. So let's say I'm sweeping around, trying to see if there's anything muddy. Well, that sounds pretty muddy, so let's cut that out. It does make the guitar tone sound more crisp and clear, especially in solo. We get the same thing happening here that I was trying to show you with the kick drum and the bass drum. Now again, this might be subtle, so listen carefully. I'll A-B it. When the low mids are scooped out, the guitar and bass sound really separate and the mix loses energy. But when they're back in, the guitar and bass kind of meld and mesh together and they both sound bigger as a result. Now, just to clear something up, when I'm talking about not cutting the low mids, I'm talking about guitar and bass. All right, I know that on rock, pop, metal drums, you're gonna scoop out a lot of those low mids, especially on your kick drum 
and your toms. That's normal. That's the sound. I'm, I'm not talking about drums here though. And this problem with not having enough low mid content, that's going to be even worse if you're mixing with the subwoofer, because again, you're going to be fooled into thinking you have all this fat, big, low end, but you take it out somewhere that doesn't produce those low frequencies as much, and it's going to sound weak. It's going to be a hole in the low end of your mix. And the fix for this is dead simple. Like I already said, just stop cutting the low mids. And even for me to this day, I've, I've mostly gotten over this habit of cutting the low mids, but sometimes I have to fight that compulsion because it does sound so pleasing at first when you scoop out that 250 hertz. So I still make a conscious effort to not cut low mids on bass and on guitars, even on vocals, unless it's very clear and obvious that there's a problem there. And I kid you not, that is how I solve the problem of not having enough low end power in my mixes. Now I know these tips are weird. They might seem backwards. They might seem controversial in the world of YouTube, but this is hard won knowledge and advice that's come from many, many mixes under my belt. So let the frequencies overlap. Don't mix with a subwoofer and don't cut the low mids. Try these out in your next mix and then drop a comment below and let us know how much bigger your mix sounds. And hey, if you're looking for some more controversy, one of the topics that I see the most non nonsense online about is gain staging within your DAW and with your plugins. So if you've been trying to figure out this whole gain staging thing, go ahead and check out this video here to see why you can stop stressing out about it because it's all pretty much a bunch of baloney. Check it out.